Lightning has always fascinated humanity. The whole concept of electrical charge charging through the sky has terrified and excited people for thousands of years. But we also see the effects in the terms of static electricity where we touch something and we get slightly zapped. But what is electrical charge? What is its nature? How can we use it to understand how matter behaves? Hi, and welcome to High School Physics Explained. Before we move on, it's helpful to have a little bit of a historical look at the idea of electrical charge, which for many thousands of years was very poorly understood. So the first concept of electrical charge relates to the early Greeks. And the early Greeks played around with amber. And amber, of course, is petrified tree sap. They discovered that when you rub it against your clothes, you get this crackling effect of charge. And as a result, they actually named the phenomena after the Greek word for amber, which is electros. So the concept of electricity, the word electricity, actually relates to the Greek word for amber. The real first step forward, though, to having an understanding a little bit of electrical charge was a French scientist by the name of Dufay. And he said, look, there's electrical charges and there seems to be two types. And if they are the same, they repel. And if they are different, then they attract. And so he was of the opinion that there was these two types of electrical fluid that existed in matter and interacted with each other. Benjamin Franklin, however, very much interested in electrical charge. And in fact, in the 1750s, as a reasonably young man in his late 40s, was interested in electrical charge and actually flew a kite and showed that lightning was a state of electrical charge. Not exactly a smart thing to do, considering he could have been electrocuted. But he was of the opinion of the one fluid theory. He disagreed with Dufay, and rather than having two types of substances, two types of electrical fluid, he believed there was only one type of electrical fluid, which is actually what we believe today. And he coined the term that if the electrical fluid was present, it, he named it positive, and if it was not present, it was negative. And there we got the terms of positive and negative. But it wasn't until J.J. Thompson, in his famous experiment with the cathode ray tube, that he discovered the nature of our electrical fluid when he discovered the electron in his investigation of cathode rays. We now know, of course, that our understanding of charge has in some way a connection to our understanding of the structure of the atom. Now, of course, here is a simplified version of the atom, and of atom doesn't literally look like this. It's much more complex, and for you quantum physicists out there, you know how wrong this image is. But this planetary model, in essence, gives us an understanding of charge, and that is we have a nucleus inside an atom that contains neutrons and protons, and we know protons have a positive charge, and around that nucleus, at a significant distance, relatively speaking, we have our electrons, and our electrons have our negative charge. So these are a fundamental basic unit of charge, our electron. That, of course, means the overall atom is a neutral substance because it has equal numbers of protons and electrons for a neutral atom. So therefore, what is the nature of charge? It is a property commonly attributed to protons and electrons. That sort of really doesn't answer the question about what it is, but in essence, we name charge as something that is given to protons and electrons. Secondly, they experience forces when they are placed in an electric field and in a magnetic field, that is, if they are moving. Again, it doesn't answer the question, what is charge? But we know it is present if the objects that are charged experience forces in an electric field or in a magnetic field. Thirdly, we know, of course, it's positive and negative. We've already discussed that. And something is positively charged if there are more protons than electrons in a given area. Similarly, something is negatively charged in a substance if there are more electrons than protons in a given area. The symbol we use for charge is the symbol Q, and it is measured in the unit called coulombs. A single coulomb of charge is equivalent to the charge of 6.24 by 10 to the power of 18 electrons. So that's quite a large amount of charge. And so therefore the charge of an electron is the inverse of that value. And we have a value of 1.6 by 10 to the negative 19 coulomb. 
Now it's negative here, not because it's of a direction, but that's the nature of the charge. In this case, an electron is a negatively charged particle. So now let's look at the concept of the conservation of charge. And so here I have a rod that has equal numbers of positive charges and negative charges. Now, this is a model, so this is not supposed to represent the structure of atoms. I'm just trying to represent that we have equal numbers of protons and electrons, that we have equal number of positive and negative charges, and they are distributed evenly. So the overall substance is neutral. Now, my positive charge, the red things over here, you see, can't move. I can't move them at all, and that's pretty much what's true in reality. The protons, or the nuclei of the atoms, stay relatively still. They can't move. However, our electrons are able to move, and on the right conditions, I can move them to, let's say, a particular end. Let's say... I were to apply a strong positive charge in this end, then my electrons will be attracted towards that end. And what I'm trying to show you is that I'm not losing any electrons in this case. What's happening is, is that we have a different distribution. And so because in this given area we have less electrons than protons, we can say that this area is slightly positively charged. This area we have a greater concentration of negatively charged particles, so therefore we have a negative end. The conservation charge is we don't actually lose positive charges or negative charges. The total numbers remain the same. Now surely I can remove these off the rod, like so. Now, what that means is, overall, this develops a positive charge. However, wherever these electrons go, we're going to develop a negative charge. I'm not losing them, they're not disappearing from the universe. So we have the concept of conservation of charge. The total number of protons and electrons remains the same, it's just a different distribution. And so that summarizes a brief introduction to charge. In subsequent videos, we'll look at the concept of electric field, the concept of Coulomb's law, which is the forces in between charges, and also then look at electrons moving in a circuit, which leads us to the whole concept of current electricity. I'm hoping that this has helped you understand the basics of electric charge. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.